sermon was brought to you by Revival Center Bulawayo. And so, Father, as we come into your presence, I know that there are many hearts that are struggling with various circumstances uh, through relationships, through trials, through finances, through sickness. Lord, where they, they need to be depending on you. We've come to depend on you. So, Father, as we sit under your anointing, may you speak your truth to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Life is not easy. And I know all of us are going through various trials and tribulations. All of us are going through various circumstances and situations. A couple of weeks ago, we were talking, as I introduced this topic of authenticity, which is one of the values we hold as a church, because it's important to us. And what is important to us is we believe what's important to God is important to us. God's Word is a high value to God the Father, and so we hold that in high esteem. We believe God designed us to live authentic lives. And so we've been expressing what does that look like? What is an authentic life? as we align ourselves completely under the authority and lordship of Jesus Christ. What does it mean to live an authentic life? And a couple of weeks ago when I introduced the topic, I spoke about philosophy. And some people went, wow, you know, okay, philosophy, how's that going to help me? You know, philosophy is not going to pay the bills. Philosophy is not going to put food on the table. I can't eat philosophy. Philosophy is not going to help me get married or help me in my relationship. Um, and so, you know, it's very easy to get caught up in things, and we start looking at, at ourselves and saying, well, I need this, and I need that, and if only I had a little bit more money, I'm going to ask you right now, what is it that you need that would make your life different right now? Is it some more money? Is it some pleasure? Uh, all of us could do with a little bit more money, wouldn't we? Wouldn't it be good to have a bit more money? Is that going to change your life? What's going to change your life right now? For what you need for your circumstance? What do you, what do you need? Do you need health? Maybe a little bit of excitement in your life. Some of us just need a reason to wake up in the morning and have some hope. What's going to change your life? Bigger house? Faster car? Roads without potholes? So we think about all these things, but as we do, think about what would change our life. What's the focus on? The focus is on you. If I had, my life would be better. If only this would change, I would live my dream. The focus is on you. And secondly, the thing I've realized is the focus is not only on you, but it's temporary. Because when you get that money, it's soon gone. When you get that pleasure high, it's, you've got to come down. And so we think that we know what we need, but actually our needs are focused on myself and the temporary. I mean, let's, let's, let's be honest. We come to church, we sit here, and we say, well, what's the point in sitting at church? How is it going to change my life? How is it going to change my circumstances, the things that I'm facing on a day-to-day -day basis? When we really look at it, we realize that what we're looking at is selfish and temporary. And God wants to bring all things under the authority of Christ. The Bible says He will bring all things under the authority of Christ. And when we look at what we've just read, we're putting our feelings and our emotions as our top priorities. It's based on the flesh. What would make this flesh happy? But when we read the Scriptures... It starts off in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23, says, Now may the God of peace, we spoke about his peace this morning. I sensed his peace. Didn't you feel that beautiful sense of God's peace in this room? May God of peace make you holy. Now I love the word holy. Holy not only means cleansed and clean, but it means whole. That's where we get our word for whole. Complete. Holy. You can put W-H-O-L-Y, either holy or made holy, made complete, made one together in every way. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless 
until our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. God will make this happen because he who called you is faithful. Now when God puts things in order in his word, the order is important. Take note of the order. It says your spirit, then your soul, and then your body. Your body is not the king. Your body makes a good slave but makes a terrible master. The Bible calls it your flesh. Your spirit needs to be aligned under the authority of Christ. When your th- your, the spirit is aligned, so your body comes into alignment. Remember, that's the battleground, your mind, will, and emotions. You fight to get that in alignment with God's plans and purposes for your life. And then your body will follow. I was blessed this week. Um, Phoebe uh, goes to a youth group and they invited me to come and speak. And they spoke on the topic of eros or erotic love. Now, I mean, for them there, they were like, yes, we like talking about sex. But for me as a speaker, it's like, you know, I'm the one who has to do the talking. But in it, we were talking about how if we allow Eros, which is actually the Greek God of love, if we allow him to be the God over our life, just like the children of Israel, when they choose to reject God and worship a calf, Take your eyes off the living God and Eros becomes your God. Eros will lead to destruction because you're trying to please the passion of your flesh until we submit the God Eros to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and put it in its rightful place. For even Eros will bend its knee to Jesus Christ. So to live authentically, you've got to, as Pastor Eric rightly said, know who you are, define who you are. You are rightly aligned as spirit, soul and body under the authority of Jesus Christ. And these things need to be in alignment and brought together. So authenticity is when all of these line up. When you're living a life where everything is in alignment, you're the same inside and out. This was the introduction we had last week. I I mean, this is what I spoke about a couple of weeks ago, and this is the introduction in today. And to say to do that, you need to start with truth, because the Bible tells us that truth leads to holiness. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. When we understand who God is, Jesus said, I am truth. And I came to testify to truth. So when we align ourselves with his truth, we will live in holiness. We will be whole and complete. Holiness then leads to freedom. Because I'm whole, I'm free to be who I need to be. I'm not playing games. I'm not pretending to be somebody. I'm not one person when I'm at the office and another person when I'm at school and another person when I'm at church. Putting on different face masks to different groups of people. I'm the same person. Whether I'm standing at the pulpit or whether I'm at home with my family, I need to be the same person. So holiness leads to freedom. For where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. His truth leads us to holiness. His holiness leads to freedom. And then freedom leads to contentment. Contentment is a happy life. You know, we try and choose happiness without going through the process of holiness. Hello? Where does it lead? Destruction. If you want to find freedom and contentment, it comes through truth. Truth leads to holiness. Holiness leads to freedom. Freedom leads to contentment. Now I'm happy. My happiness is not dependent on my car, on my wife, on my house, on how much money I have in the bank account. My contentment is based on the fact that I'm living an authentic life. That's what people are chasing. There are people who have lots of money in the bank, but they are miserable. Paul says, for I have learned how to be content in whatever I have, and I have learned the secret of living in every, every situation, for I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Why? Because I'm living in truth. So let's look at some practicalities about this. We spoke about philosophies, and some of you are like, okay, philosophy, that's great, but I want to know how it's going to change my life. Let's make it a bit more practical. Pastor Nkosi spoke a little way uh, last week about taking off the masks and being real and allowing ourselves to be vulnerable and real with one another. So we want to dig deep into the practicality. So I'm going to go to the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 3, where Paul was talking to the Corinthian church. And he said, I established you as a church, and you were going really well, but then you just hit a 
Now you're in sexual sin and you're doing all sorts of crazy things and your lives are a mess. So he begins to address them. And I'm going to do it all from the Message Bible today because I think it holds quite a punch. In fact, when I read it, it gave me a punch. And so I'd like to share that punch with you. Maybe it'll dampen the impact or maybe increase the impact, I pray. So let's read it together. Let me read it for you. It says in the Message Bible, For you right now, my friends, Paul writes, I'm completely frustrated by your unspiritual dealings with each other and with God. Eesh. What a start to the sermon. Paul says, I'm not happy with you guys. The way you deal with each other is very unspiritual. And the way you're dealing with God is very unspiritual. He says, you're acting like infants in relation to Christ. Capable of nothing more than nursing at the breast. Well then, I'll nurse you since you don't seem capable of anything more. As long as you grab for what makes you feel good and makes you look important, you, are you really much different than a babe at the breast, content only when everything is going your way? Does that sound like people that we know today? All you're interested in is what makes you feel good and what makes you look good. Paul says, if that's, what you, if that's what your Christian life is about, you feeling good and you looking good, then you're no more than a baby. Crying out, Lord, ah, 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 every two minutes. It's time for us to grow up, church. We want to live authentic lives. We can't live authentic lives as babies. That's what babies do. I'm in this together with you. I'm not standing up here looking down at you and saying, you babies. I'm saying, Paul is saying to us and reminding us, if this is the kind of life you're living, you're acting like a baby. So let's recognize the fact. As long as you're focused on those things, you're still a nursing infant. So when one of you says, I'm on Paul's side, the other says, I'm for Apollos, aren't you being totally infantile? Who do you think Paul is anyway? Or Apollos for that matter. Servants, both of us, servants who waited on you as you gradually learned to entrust your lives to our mutual master. We each carried out our servant assignment. I planted the seed, Apollos watered the seed, but God made you grow. It's not the one who plants or the one who waters who is at the center of this process, but God who makes things grow. Planting and watering are menial servant jobs at minimum wages. What makes them worth doing is the God we are serving. You happen to be God's field in which we are working. So what's Paul saying here? He's saying stop looking to others for validation. Some of you say, oh, I like Pastor Wayne when he preaches. No, I like Pastor Eric when he preaches. I like it when Kevin leads the worship. No, I like it when Hannington leads the worship. I like this, I like that. And we're looking for validation when my parents validate me, when my friends validate me. We're looking for external things to validate who we are internally. That's not an authentic life. When those outside of you are telling you who you should be. He says, we're merely servants. Some of us plant seeds, some of us water seeds. But we're servants trying to get God to do the work inside of you. God is the one who brings the growth and that happens from the inside out. You need to live life from the inside out, not from the outside in. Stop looking for validation. It's like on a Sunday, I try as my best to try and meet as many of you as possible. You'll see me like a busy bee sometimes. Great to see you. It's keeping well. How's it going, Dad? How are you doing? How are you doing? And then I can't get to everybody because there's a lot of people here. Then someone says, I saw the pastor the other day. didn't even greet me. <laughs> oh, that church. Yeah, you know, the pastor, doesn't he, he knows me, but didn't even greet me. What are you doing? You're looking for validation from somebody else. Me greeting you doesn't make you important or more important or less important. You're already valuable. Because you know who you are. So don't look for others to validate who you are. He, put, he carries on in this vein. He says, or to put it another way, you are God's house. Using the gift God gave me as a good architect, I designed the blueprints. Apollos is putting up the walls. Let each carpenter come with a job to build on the foundation. But remember, there is only one foundation. The one that has already been laid, Jesus Christ. Take particular care in picking out your building materials. Eventually, there's going to be an inspection. And if you use cheap or inferior materials, you'll be found out. 
The inspection will be thorough and rigorous. I'll say it again. The inspection will be thorough and rigorous. You won't get away with a thing. If your work passes inspection, fine. If it doesn't, your part of the building will be torn down and started over. But you, you won't be torn out, but you'll survive, but just barely. So what's Paul saying here? At the end of your life, when you stand before God, all of your works will be put on the altar. Holy fire will come down onto that altar. And that which is authentic will remain. That which is not authentic will be burnt up. What will you have to show for an eternity? That's why you've got to be careful on what you build. Jesus is the foundation. He took off everything and laid himself bare as the foundation. He says, the foundation has been set, now you build on this foundation. What are you building? Precious, gold, precious minerals, gold, silver, or are you building with wood, hay, and stubble? You think it's important. Look at what I'm building. Look what I'm building. Wait until the fire comes. What's left? He says, some of you will get to heaven smelling like smoke. It's like, phew, you just missed hell by this much, buddy. <laughs> you got through by your fingertips. Not my words, Paul's, read it. He says, as some of you, yes, there'll be no works to show, but you'll still be in heaven. Because we know you love God and your relationship with God is what secures your place in heaven. But your works will account to nothing. That's challenging. You know, babies don't build houses. If you bring babies to a building site, they're like me playing cars with the building sand and putting bricks to make little paths around. They're not going to build. Are we babies playing around with the building materials or are we getting ready to start building what God's called us to build? This is authenticity. What's going to stand? There's only one foundation on which you build, and that will be Christ. Choose what you build. Choose what you build with. Because it will be tested. You know, it's nice to come to church and have a happy, clappy message, and we all go, oh, yes! But sometimes we need these kind of messages to remind us what we're doing with our lives. Things that are going to last forever. So I'm going to finish the last part, and then we're going to break it down into three points, but he finishes with this in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He says, don't you realize, all of you, don't you realize, all of you, that you are the temple of God? And God himself is present in you. No one will get by with vandalizing God's temple. You can be sure of that. God's temple is sacred and you, remember, are the temple. Don't fool yourselves. Don't think that you can be wise merely by being up to date with the times. Be God's fool. That's the path to true wisdom. What the world calls smart, God calls stupid. What the world calls smart, God calls stupid. It is written in Scripture, He exposes the chicanery of the sheik. The master sees through the smoke screens of the know-it-alls. I don't want to hear any of you bragging about yourself or anyone else. Everything is already yours as a gift. He writes, everything is already yours. Paul, Apollos, Peter, the world, life, death, the present, the future, all of it is yours, and you are privileged to be in union with Christ who is in union with God. In other words, Pastor E is a gift to us because you've already got everything else you need. He's just a bonus. I'm just a bonus. Pastor Kevin's just a bonus. We're all just a bonus, but we, we cheerleaders clapping you on because you're on top of the world already, because you already have Christ. He says, you don't need anything else. You've already got Jesus. What more do you need? What more do you need? So what's our excuses? We are the temple of God, and we have everything that you need. It's actually a privilege to be in union with Christ. So I've got three points with you. All of them begin with the letters F, S and F. The first one is this, strong foundation. Strong foundation. There's no need to be looking for me or Pastor E or Paul or Apollos to lay the foundation. The foundation's been built. The foundation is Christ. Jesus is your only foundation. You are a son, you're a daughter of God, and God is proud of you. 
God loves you. So what do we do in practical terms? Well, this is what I do in my life. At the start of each day and at the end of each day, I try and look for time when I can be alone. And I relish solitude and quietness. Because how are we going to hear God speaking to us if our minds are filled with the sounds of the world around us? Do you know, we spend so much time on the gram. You know, if you spend 10% of the time you spend on the gram listening to God, you would be a powerhouse for the kingdom. Because the wisdom of the world is foolishness to God. You know why you've got to do it at the beginning of the day? Because in the beginning of the day, you sit with the Lord and say, Lord, I love you so much. I'm your son, and you've got plans for me today. Every day of my life is precious. The Lord will say to you today, Nathan, you're going to meet three people. The first person, this is what you've got to say. The second person, this is what you've got to do. The third person, this is how you're going to help them out. And when that person bumps into you today, Nathan says, I'm glad you came this way. The Lord would tell me you were going to be here today, and this is what I need to tell you. Suddenly they're crying. Please pray for me. I'd love to pray with you. Their lives are changed. Why? Because you spent five minutes listening to the Father that morning about them. But we want to wake up and sit on Instagram and Facebook and busy ourselves, music, busy with television, busy with everything else, but we don't want to listen to what Father God has to say for your life. We're nursing babes, wanting our own flesh to be desired when God is trying to speak to our spirits. We drown every voice out except God's. We need to drown all those voices out. Keep quiet and listen to God. Then when you meet people, you've got something to say. You've got something to give. Then you've got a prophetic word for them. Say, Granny Noble, this is what the Lord says to you today. Don't give up, sister. There's still time allotted to you because there's things that you need to fulfill. There's things you need to say to others. There's still things you need to do. Don't give up. Morris, stop fighting with the Lord. has got a plan there and he's putting you dead in the center. You've got what it takes. The Lord will give you the words to say to the people that you meet every single day and every single moment if you're listening to him. The thing is we're not tuned into God. We who are the body of Christ are not tuned into what God has to say. Why? The foundation has already been built. Now you need to build on that. Take time of solitude every day. Look forward to the moment where you wake up and say, I'm going to spend a few minutes with my dad. I need to hear what he says. Then when someone says, Nkosi, should we, you want to come with me to Wangi? He says, hold on, I need to see what my dad says first. So you've got to live life from the inside out. Build on what's already been perfected. I'll give you this picture. You've heard me say it, and I'd like to share it with you again. It's like the artist, Michelangelo, looking at a block of marble. And inside he says, I see David standing there, strapping with his slingshot over his shoulder. You say, huh? I just see a block of marble. He says, no, there's a David in there. And what he does is he takes his chisel and his hammer. And slowly he chips away that which is not David to reveal the truth of David standing there. Do you know, when you're a child of God, you have everything inside you already. You are made whole and holy because you've come to Christ. The reason people don't see it is because you've got all this other crud around you that the Lord needs to chip away. We're looking outside and say, one day when I become holy, one day when I get that money, one day when this happens, we're looking outside of us to become holy. The Lord says it's already put inside of you. Stop looking outside, it's inside of you. Allow the Lord, submit by His grace to the Lord, chipping away that which is not the authentic you. So that the authentic you may be revealed to the world. The world is waiting to see the real you. I don't think there's a person in this room that's reached even 10% of what God has designed them for. There's so much more in you. There's so much more that God has for you. Just yield to his processes and allow him to knock away all that rubbish. The foundation has already been set. God's grace is more than enough. 
You don't need to try and be anybody other than yourself. Just be you. Authenticity is being true to who God created you to be. So the second one is solid food. Strong foundation. This is taken from the passage we read. If we want to mature, the first thing we need is a solid foundation. Second thing we need, a strong foundation. Second thing is solid food. Eat the meat like your life depends on it, because it does. You know, we, we, we want the pastor to eat the word, digest it, and then like a mother bird, come to your babies, open your beaks, and drop little bits of food into you so we can say, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, and you walk away saying, I'm full now. It's time you started eating the meat for yourself. Can I get an amen? That's why I say read the word for yourself. Don't just take my word for it. Go and read what God says. Start reading it for yourself. Start to eat the solid food. Start using your brains. Let me, let me give an example of a parent. You say to a kid, what do you want to eat? Fizz pops, Coke, fizz pops, chips, fizz pops. If they could, they'd have that all the time. But as a parent, you say, no, no, no. You're getting this food. But you know what we as Christians want? We want the fizz pops and Coke. And then we wonder why we deformed Christians walking around with our bodies that haven't fully developed because we just want the nice things in life. And the Lord's saying, eat your meat, young man. Open your brains. Let me tell you now, each and every one of you here knows what God wants of you, but you're not doing it. You're waiting for me to come up here and give you a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom and say this is what the Lord says. But the Lord's already spoken to you and told you what to do, but we're either too lazy or too scared or too busy or too distracted to do what God's told you to do. You know what you have to do. You know the things you need to say. You know the relationships you need to fix. You know the things you do need to do because you're a child of God and He's been speaking to you about it for, for some time. So you need to wake up, stop making excuses, and start eating the meat that God has for you. But you know what we like? We like those children where we get fed the bro broccoli and the Brussels sprouts, and we get the bread and we hide it underneath and push it down. Or we hope the dog's under the table, you know, we'll hide it under the knife and fork that mommy doesn't want to see it. Lord, don't see that. You didn't see that. The Lord's saying, did you eat your vegetables? Yes, Lord. Says, What's that stuff under your fork there? can't fool God. He knows. Am I speaking to anybody? Turn to your neighbor and say, he's speaking to me. Every day you've got to wake up and say, what can I do that's challenging? Challenge yourself. You know what meat means? It means I'm challenging myself. So when you wake up, say, today I'm going to pray for two people. Oh, but I've never prayed for anybody apart from church. Well, today you're going to pray for somebody. You walk into the supermarket and say, there's somebody. Is that the person you need me to pray for, Lord? Is this person at work you need me to pray for? Challenge yourself and start doing things that you know God would want you to do. We'd see people healed in the streets in Bulawayo. We'd see people being saved. We'd see things happening. Why? Because you took the courage to go and make a difference. Because you're starting to eat meat. But we sit in our comfortable homes and we don't want to do anything to anybody because we don't want to. We're lazy. We're scared. Yet the world is crying out for Christians to make a difference. Challenge yourself every day. So what can I do today for the Lord? Scripture says anyone who meets a testing challenge head on and, ma and manages to stick it out is mighty fortunate. For such per persons, loyally in love with God, the reward is life and more life. Let me tell you, when you lead one person to the Lord, you want to lead another person to the Lord. And then another. And then another. When you see one person healed, you want to pray for somebody else. And then pray for somebody else. And it's like, who can I pray for, Lord? Anybody got a headache even? I want to pray for you. Can I get a witness? But we stay where we are because we're afraid. Also, the Bible says, for such person, where is it? Don't let anyone under pressure give in and to evil and say, God is trying to trip me up. God is impervious to evil and puts evil in no one's way. The temptation to give in to evil comes from us and us only. We have no one to blame but the leering, seducing flare-up of our own lust. 
Lust gets pregnant and has a baby. Sin. Sin grows into an adult and becomes the real killer. Talking about eros again. You know what we like to do? We all like to invite little tigers into our house. Little lion cubs. Oh, look at the little lion cub. Mm, what is that cute? Oh, fat, cuddly. But you know the lion cub's going to grow up and eat your head off. <laughs> Who let the lion cub into the house? You did. Oh, but it's so nice. We just hold hands here and a little wink here and we sneak around the corner there. And before we know it, we find ourselves in trouble and then our whole life has changed. Why? Because we opened up the door to a little baby lion. Now look where it's got you. Then you want to blame God. God, where are you? God, why did you let this happen to me? God, why is my life a mess? He says, I didn't open the door to the lion cub. You did. You knew it was there, and you let it in. Hey, now. So the third one is stay focused. Stay focused. SF, stay focused. Now, as a mature believer, run in your lane. Stay focused. Do what God's called you to do. Because you're mature. He carries on writing in, in, in that um, 1 Corinthians 3 towards the end. He says, for you, sorry, for who do you know that really knows you? That really knows your heart. And even if they did, is there anything that they would discover in you that you could take credit for? Isn't everything you have and everything you are, sheer gifts from the Lord. So what's the point of all this complaining and competing? You already have all you need. You already have, I love this, listen to this. You already have more access to God than you can handle. I'll say that again. You already have more access to God than you can handle. Without bringing either Apollos or me into it, you're sitting on top of the world, at least God's world, and we're sitting right there alongside with you. So what am I saying? Well, what is he saying? He's saying don't be high maintenance. Do you know those high maintenance friends? If you don't know who your high maintenance friends are, you're the one. <laughs> Do you know what I mean by high maintenance friend? Those friends where you go, oh, oh, here comes so-and-so. Yo, it's going to be hard work. We've got a tough afternoon this afternoon. High-maintenance friends. Okay? What's he saying? He's saying don't be a high-maintenance person in the kingdom. God doesn't need high-maintenance people. That's an immature person. That which is not authentic will be burnt up. So he says stop complaining. Stop comparing, stop competing. Quit complaining, quit comparing, quit competing. Do you know, if you are complaining, you're an immature believer. Listen to your comments over the last week. How much of it consisted of complaining? Paul's saying, it's time you stop complaining and start giving thanks to God. Start living a life of gratitude. Quit comparing. If you're living an authentic life, stop comparing your life with somebody else's life. You've got your own line. Run in your own lane. You made differently to everybody else. Run in your own lane. The only person you compare yourself to is who you were one year ago who you were six months ago, who you were two years ago. That's the only person you compare yourself to. Where was I one month ago? Where was I two months ago? Where am I today? Because we've all got different races. We've all got different journeys. Stop comparing yourself. And finally, stop competing. It's not a competition. It's not this nonsense, he who dies with the most toys wins. I mean... Hey, it's not a competition. So be courageous. So with a stay focused, in each one I've given you a challenge. 
First challenge was try and find a quiet place every morning, every evening, whenever you can, and just listen to what God is speaking to you about. Be quiet before him. The second challenge is start to look for things you can do every day that pushes you a little bit as a believer. Maybe you only read two verses a day, push it to three. Maybe you can push something there, push something there, but you need to stretch a bit, eh? You need to, you know, if you're going to build your weight, your spiritual muscles, you've got to push against things that bring resistance. The more resistance you get, the more you work those muscles. Hello? Can I get an amen to any of the bodybuilders out there? You need resistance to make you stronger. And in this one, stay focused is add value to others. Why? Because the kingdom of God is made up of people. You can't take your fishing rod to heaven. They'll be provided there for you, I'm sure. But it's about the people. So you add value to the people that you meet. When I meet somebody, how can I add value to them? What can I say that will encourage them? How can I help them further along the path that they they have? And so you really have what you need. You have more than enough access to God than you can handle. I love that. You're sitting on top of the world and we're sitting along there right with you. We're just cheerleaders. Pastor Kevin and I, we're just cheerleaders. Pastor E is just a cheerleader saying, come on guys. You've got what it takes, my brother. Now do it. I'm not talking about behavior modification. I'm talking by a life transformed standing on the foundation of Jesus Christ. I'm not saying taking your old life and trying to make it better. I'm saying starting a brand new life on Jesus Christ. Because you can't start a life on, on any other foundation other than which is Christ. If you want to last forever. If you want it to be building forever. It's not about trying harder harder either. Some of you are sitting there saying, oh, pastor, but you know, I'm trying so hard. And Zimbabwe is hard. And finances are hard. And getting to church is hard. I'm not saying try harder. I'm saying yield to what the Holy Spirit wants to do in you. Allow him to do the work. We sang a song, Amazing Grace. God's grace is amazing. Grace is not just the power to forgive or, 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 or cover the wrong things we've done. Grace is to empower you to do what you need to do. So when you say, I need to be speaking to my wife, Lord, give me grace. He gives you the grace so that you have the power. Power is the fuel to enable you to do what you, God's called you to do. It's the superactive hyperjet fuel that God has given to you and I. You cannot live without grace. You cannot move without grace. You cannot be effective or authentic without the grace of God. It is only by His grace that we can do what He's called us to do. It's not about trying harder or being somebody else. It's about being who I am, empowered by the Holy Spirit. Colossians chapter 3, verses 3 to 4 says, Your old life is dead. I love this. Now it comes to the conclusion. You can read that last statement. So beautiful. It says, your old life is dead. Turn to your neighbor and say, your life is dead. But your new life, your real life, your authentic life, even though it's invisible to the spectators, to those around you, is with Christ in God. He is your life, and when Christ, your real life, remember, shows up again on this earth, you'll show up too, the real you, the glorious you. Meanwhile, be content with obscurity like Christ. Maybe nobody's taking notice of you. Maybe you're a a wallflower. Maybe you think you're a nobody, but God notices. He knows what's going on inside. He says, my brother, keep going. I've got this. I'm with you. And the day when our real life is revealed, our authentic self is revealed, the whole world will see there he is. There's my brother, there's my sister. There's the man that I've created you to be. There's the man you're designed to be. There's the woman you're designed to be. This is a challenge for all of us. That's why we desire authenticity, to be who God created us to be. So I've got time for one more story. I wasn't going to tell the story, but um, I was talking to Phoebe this week, and she said, Dad, are you going to tell the story at debrief? 
So I said, no, my girl, I don't think so. She said, Dad, you've got to tell the story. So I said, no, I don't know if they'll appreciate the story. She said, Dad, you've got to tell the story. So it reminded of me today, it reminded me of it today as I was preparing my notes. And it's the story of my first kiss. Oh, you see... <laughs> That's a brother for you. And that's the same response I got in the first service too. Everybody got suddenly very embarrassed and very like, oh, yeah, or excited or something, I don't know. But I want to tell you the story why. Not to boast about myself. Listen carefully, I want to use it as an illustration of a young man when he was seven or eight who said, Lord, I want to give my life completely to you. I want to live for you in every area. That was my heart. And I may have been naive, I may have been stupid, but I just wanted to love God with everything I had. It's just who I was. I said, not boasting, it's my story. When I was 17, um, you know, I, I handled relationships very delicately because I wanted to do things right. And I hadn't been kissed yet, so I was a late bloomer. <laughs> and my brother and I, we organized a party with my sisters. It was one of our birthdays. I can't remember which or if it was just a function, but we lived in Mizvingo at the time. And we had friends who, who lent us at the, at the trade fair there, one of the buildings we could use. And we decorated. We were going to have a punk party. So there we were spread out, hair, you know, <laughs> sharp like a, like a razor blade, and leather and punk and pink. You know, the punk was big in the 80s. This was the 80s, by the way, showing my age. <laughs> Fantastic. There we were putting up the music and the posters and the lights with the boombox. You know those days, with the boombox on your shoulder, stick it on. We had Madonna playing True Blue, Baby, I Love You, and we're busy dancing there with our friends. We've got all our friends come and join us for a party. All our friends we knew. Come on, guys, let's have a party. And so we all were dancing there together. And, and I just met this young girl. She was quite a lot shorter than me. She had dark black hair, freckles, and braces. And she was the most beautiful thing I had seen. <laughs> she smiled so sweetly. Anyway, somehow we managed to end up dancing together. And I was busy dancing with her. And she comes up to me. She whispers in my ear, do you want to come around the back with me? And I'm like, why? Is it getting hot in here or is it just me? Amanda's loving this, isn't she? Uh, so, I mean, I was thinking, man, but all my friends are here. I'm going to miss out. This is where the party is. And you know what I want to go around the back for? You just come around the back. So go around the back, and she puts her arms around me, and we, we you know, you're always wondering about your first kiss. Is the nose right? Is it squonk? <laughs> Move in for the kill. Actually, she was the one who kissed me. I was just like, whoa, okay. But it was, it was amazing. It was my first kiss, you know. I still remember it. Braces and all. It was a lovely kiss. Don't knock a girl with braces, you know. <laughs> so there I was. And... Um, we walked back inside because I was quick to get back inside now. I <laughs> could feel the heat. I thought, no, I need to get back in. And I thought everybody knew, so I'm very self-conscious now. You know, <laughs> grinning from ear to ear, thinking, okay, but well, does anybody know anything? Anyway, I didn't know this girl very well at all. To be honest, I didn't know her at all. And my heart said to me, if she's good enough to kiss, she's good enough to lead to Jesus. She's good enough to introduce her to my king. That's how I was. How can I kiss someone and not introduce them to Jesus? In my brain, it didn't, didn't work. So I said to her, I'd love to talk to you more. I'd like to get to know you. 
Because, you know, you're in that eros moment, you know. Flesh first. So the next, next day, I said, it, I think it was a Saturday. I said, uh, the party was Friday night. Saturday, I said, let's, let's spend some time together. So we decided, just outside Ms. Vingo, there's a little copy. And our house was not too far from it. Some of those you know Ms. Vingo. There's a little copy on the way. And uh, I said, let's go and have a picnic on the copy. So I got my mom to help me put some things together for the picnic. And she came and met me. We rode our bicycles out, just like Stranger Things. You know, you think it doesn't happen, but it was like that in those days. <laughs> Riding your bikes out in the bush. You know, that's what we did in those days. Any 80s kids can recognize that. It was our transport those days. Get on your bike if you want to do anything. So off we rode to the copies. We sat on the copy and she said her story with me and she came from a broken home. And she was looking for affirmation. She was looking for love. She could see something in me that was attractive to her. That she wanted. So I shared Jesus with her. And there on that copy, she gave her life to Christ. I get emotional because I haven't thought about it for years. I could see the change in her eyes. She had a hope. I gave her more than a kiss. I gave her Jesus. Because it's worth it. That's living authentic for Christ. That when you're at the shopping center, you see somebody who needs help with their bags, you help them. And say, the Lord asked me to help you with your bags, but actually you need more help than these bags. You need Jesus. Let me pray for you. That's being authentic. Authentic is seeing somebody at work. You know they've just lost a lover and you come alongside them and say, I see you so down. Can I pray for you? Looking for Jesus in every moment. Sharing your life in every moment. That's the heart of somebody who wants for you to live a life that's authentic. Because it's worth it. Worth it. Every day it's worth it. And if you don't think so, when you get to heaven, you won't be smelling a smoke. You would have built with gold. Precious stones. So when I got back, my dad came home from work. He said, Son, what did you get up to today? He said, Dad, I went up the copy with this girl I just met. She says, wow, what did you do? Thank you. You're, you're very kind, thank you. I think I need a whole box. <laughs> can go sit down now. I said, son, what did you do there? I said, dad, I preached the gospel. So my dad said to me, is that what you call it these days? <laughs> Let's bow our heads and pray. <laughs> Lord Jesus, we love you. And we're here today because we want to live authentic lives. We want to be real. We wake up with ourselves every morning and we go to bed with ourselves every night. We've got to see ourselves in the mirror. We want to live with that person, knowing that I'm whole and holy and I'm the right person at the right place, rightly aligned by your Spirit. But Lord, it's tough. There's so many distractions and things that are so hard and the decisions I've made, it's hard. But today, Lord, I know that with your help, I can be who you created me to be. Father, you see my heart. And I lift it up to you today. Like that amazing chiropractor you are, I pray that you would crack every bone and bring it back into place. 
I know some of those things are going to be tough. There's things I've got to do. I know it's not easy, but with your grace, I can do it. I can make it right. Give me the wisdom and an ear to hear your voice so that at every turn I can know what it is you've called me to do. We thank you for today's message. And I pray, Lord, that we would stand strong on the foundation of Jesus Christ. We thank you that you laid down your life that we may build on it. I pray, Lord, that I would chew those steaks and eat that healthy food that I may grow stronger and stronger with every passing day. Chewing on the cut of God's word. And Lord, I pray you help me to stay focused. To keep my eyes on you. Give me the strength, Lord. I'd like in the next 30 seconds just for you to say your own prayer, to quieten your hearts before the Lord and say your own prayer to Him. Father, we thank you that you hear each and every prayer today. I'll ask you just to stand as I depart you with the blessing. Amen. You're welcome to keep your eyes open as we bless you and you bless one another. Please stay for a cup of tea afterwards. We'd love to fellowship with you. We'd love to get you to know you a little bit more as we together learn how to live authentic lives for Jesus. And now, Mother Grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. The love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you from the moment you walk out this building until we see him again face to face. May his love permeate every aspect of your being. May your heart be filled to overflowing with his joy. Courageously live your lives on a foundation that is unmoving and unchangeable. God, have your way in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. May the Lord bless you. This sermon was brought to you by Revival Center Bulawayo. 